We've already seen in other tutorials how a plane wave incident on an interface at an angle theta 1 coming from a material refractive index on 1 will exit at a different angle theta 2 when it's entering re material refractive index n2. We've known that, of course, for a very long time. That's called Snell's Law. Let me remind you of some of the different mathematical ways we've expressed that because there happens to be a nice graphical way of relating to this refraction problem, which is going to be very powerful throughout the rest of the course where we study interfaces. One way we've said it in this xy coordinate system is that the ky equals qy. So the y component, in this case the vertical component of the k vector and the q vector have the same height. I've tried to draw that about in perspective here. That's mathematically equivalent. ky simply equals k sine theta 1, so that equals q sine theta 2. These two expressions are equal to each other. And then through a little bit of calculation, when you have a k on one side and a q on the other side, you can end up replacing that with an n1 on one side and an n2 on the other side. Other constants simply are the same on both sides and cancel out. And we get the familiar Snell's Law expression that we walked into Optics 262 already knowing. So there's a nice geometrical construction that is the purpose of this tutorial. Let's consider the case where n2 is glass and n1 is air, or in general some situation where n2 is greater than n1. So I like to write that by just indicating the size of some variables. So I could say that n1, some number, and then we've got n2 on, some, on the other side. So this, I'm just a little dashed line to relate these two. On one side we've got n1, on the other side we've got n2, and n2 is larger. Well, that means that the speed of light is different on the two sides, and that means that the wavelength of the light will be different on both sides. And in air, the wavelength lambda 1 is going to be, in this case, larger than lambda 2. And we could lastly ask ourselves if we know what's the, what about the value of k, since we're thinking about the total length of these vectors. Well, we know that k is 2 pi over lambda, so if lambda 1 is the bigger thing, then it must be that q, and I'm going to write q squared because you'll see why. k squared is the smaller quantity, q squared is the larger quantity. And what's q squared mathematically equal to? It's, equal, it's proportional to k squared and the proportionality constant turns out to be n2 over n1 squared times k squared. So you can again see that q, the length of q and q squared is greater than the length of k squared by this ratio. So there's a nice graphical construction that relates k and q, which is the purpose of this tutorial. To start the graphical construction, I'm going to take these two vectors and instead of drawing them end to end, I'm going to start with the k vector and I'm going to draw a particular point in space to anchor myself. So there's a point in space and from that I'm going to draw a k vector that's approximately the same as that one to within my artistic ability limits. So that's our k vector. It has a length k. And it has a particular projection in the y direction, which we'll make evident right there. So it's got a ky. And this is generic. We happen to be pointing in this direction, but we could have been aiming our beam in any other direction. And no matter what direction I point the beam within air, within material of refractive index n1, the length of that k vector is going to be the same. Length of that vector being the same emanating from that dot, that means I'm describing geometrically a circle. So let me actually draw in that circle. I'll call it an index circle. Give myself a few points for to aim for here. So there's this circle of radius k, which is proportional to the refractive index, which is why I'm calling it an index circle. So the larger the refractive index, the larger this circle would be. And now whatever direction I wanted to be doing this refraction problem from, I would simply draw a k vector to touch that point on the circle and that would represent an incident beam at that angle. 
Now what about the Q vector? I will choose another point in space and now instead of drawing these things head to tail I'm going to draw the other vector at exactly the starting from exactly the same height as the first one. Now what do I know geometrically about this Q situation? I know that the Y components of these two vectors will have to be the same. So if I extend this intersection point over to here, I know that that's got to be the value of QY. So that's a constraint based on these equations up here. But these equations over here, and I'm very sorry, this is definitely not supposed to be an equals sign. That was a typo. That's just supposed to be region 1, region 2. And that's very important right here for this discussion. The radius of the circle I should draw on this side should be bigger because the refractive index is bigger. The Q value, the length of Q, is bigger. So I now have to choose some larger value. I'll choose it to be about this big. So there's some points for me to aim for as I draw my circle. This is the Q index circle. It's got a radius Q. So now my geometrical construction tells me exactly where to draw my equivalent of the K vector, namely the Q vector. I have to draw it to hit this circle and to be at exactly this height. So now I've got it. I draw it right to here. And that's going to be my Q. And you can see that indeed I have derived that the angle that Q travels at is a theta 2 which is gentler, smaller theta 2 than theta 1. So this general idea is really very powerful. You draw two circles of different radii. The radii are proportional to the refractive index because K and Q scale the same way the refractive index does. That's why they're called index circles. And you're now able to figure out by constraining that they have the same Y component and a ratio of radii that you know, you can figure out exactly what angle something will refract at. You do then have the ability, of course, to figure out what QX is because you know what Q and QY are. So you just take QX to be the square root of Q squared minus QY squared and you can do some factoring here, which is nice, because Q squared depends on K squared, and QY squared, QY is KY, which is K sine theta 1, so QY squared has a K squared as well. So there's a K squared for both of those. You take it out of the square, you, square root, and you just get K. And what's left in here, an expression that we'll return to when we do total internal reflection, is that you get N2 over N1, squared minus sine squared of the incident angle. Just as a teaser, it is possible then if you come in at a high enough incident angle and if N2 is less than N1, you can have a situation where sine squared theta 1 is actually greater than this and the QX quantity becomes the square root of a negative number, something imaginary something we'll see in a future tutorial.